This video is on the Beatitudes. This video is heavily based on a spiritual retreat that a Dominican priest named Father James Brent gave to the Maronite monks of adoration during Lent of 2023. I used a lot of what Father James Brent taught me, but also made significant contributions from my own study. I recommend you go purchase Father James Brent fantastic new book, The Father's House, Discovering Our Home in the Trinity. I got a lot of insight from it and presented some of the material in this video. Not everything said in this video reflects the view of the aforementioned parties. Now let's begin. What are the Beatitudes? The Beatitudes are blessings listed by Christ in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 12. The Beatitudes are a sequence of steps ascending to perfection. St. Gregory of Nyssa compares the climb of the Beatitudes to the ladder in Jacob's vision, a ladder stretching from earth to the heights of heaven with God standing on it, a climb representing an unceasing desire for higher things. St. Bernard of Clairvaux says the Beatitudes are the process of conversion from being a sinner to becoming a saint. The Beatitudes allows us to walk the way of love. It's a revelation of our own hearts infused with grace. It is a code of conduct of life in the spirit. The Beatitudes teach us the new law. The old law was external and it chastised us. It was given by the prophet Moses on a mountain. The new law is the grace of the Holy Spirit in our hearts to do God's will. It was given by Christ in the Sermon on the Mount. The Beatitudes are the acts of Christ, beams of light from the heart of Christ. He wants to communicate these energies or activities to us. Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 1, 1717 says the Beatitudes depict the countenance of Jesus Christ and portray his charity. They express the vocation of the faithful associated with the glory of his passion and resurrection. They shed light on the actions and attitudes characteristic of the Christian life. They are the paradoxical promises that sustain hope in the midst of tribulations. They proclaim the blessings and rewards already secured, however dimly for Christ's disciple. The Beatitudes is the process of deification. It is adoptive sonship becoming Christ turning to the Father. Catechism paragraph 1721 says, quote, God put us in the world to know, to love, and to serve him, and to come to paradise. Beatitude makes us partakers of the divine nature and of eternal life. With beatitude, man enters into the glory of Christ and into the joy of the Trinitarian life, end quote. The Beatitudes are a divine synthesis of spiritual counsels. If you keep them before your eyes, you really have it all. It is an inexhaustible wellspring of wisdom. Now the structure of the Beatitudes goes as follows. It first states a promise, blessed are the blank. Then it states the reward, for they shall receive blank. The rewards of the Beatitudes are the proper motive for carrying out the act. For example, we are poor in spirit, to receive the kingdom of God. Each reward is another name for God. Each reward unites us to God. There's nothing wrong or guilt-inducing of wanting more God for ourselves. This is proper self-love. Wanting God for yourself is good. Since the Beatitudes are so essential, you might ask, how does one practically follow them? In Father James Brent book, The Father's House, Discovering Our Home in the Trinity, page 83, he says, quote, to walk the road of the Beatitudes, however, you and I must do three things. The first is to ponder how the Lord Jesus lived each of them. The second, is to pray for the grace to do the same. The third is to practice each one to the fullest extent possible, given where we actually are today." End quote. So in this video, we will discuss the Beatitudes, how to live them out, and we shall have examples for them from Christ and the saints. The first Beatitude is, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So the promise is for those who are poor in spirit, and the reward is the kingdom of heaven. So what is poverty of spirit? Poverty in spirit principally means humility. This is the capital beatitude. It captures it all. The rest of the beatitudes are an unfolding of this first step. We must be humble to be saved or to receive the kingdom of heaven. Humility is the opposite of pride. Pride or self-exaltation is the cause of mankind's fall. We all have a tendency to self-love and self-exaltation, making ourselves the center of reality, idolizing ourselves as God. Humility is the key to salvation. To be humble is to acknowledge our weakness, limits, and brokenness. We need this to go to heaven. Why? It's because it's impossible by nature for finite being to leap to infinite being. It is easier for you to leap over the moon than to ascend to God. We must acknowledge that God does all the work in our journey to him. He is the beginning, middle, and the end. He wills both the work and the accomplishment. We are totally dependent on him. We must have the attitude that I am a beggar on the street, begging to dwell in the heavenly light. God alone can save us. We can't save ourselves. Humility is truth, and the truth is we are made from nothing and totally depend on God at every moment of our existence. Therefore, we must humble ourselves before our Maker. We must also humble ourselves as we recognize we have sinned against the all-good God and have fallen short of His glory. Each one of us have broken His commandments and deserve to suffer the eternal torments of hell. Only the God-man Jesus Christ can reconcile us to God. We are totally dependent on Him. We must humble ourselves before Him. Another aspect of poverty of spirit that's equally important is confidence in God's goodness. We are poor, but without confidence in God's goodness, our poverty would lead to despair. To know our brokenness and our sins without knowledge of God's goodness and mercy would make us hopeless. 
we would think that we're destined to hell. So we must have our confidence in God's goodness. We are broken and we are unable to make it to heaven, but the all good God dearly loves us and went out of his way to the cross just to save you. And he'd do it all over again if you were the only one alive. We must remember that the Father is not stingy with the Holy Spirit. The Father wants to give us the Holy Spirit. God wants to save us more than we want to be saved. We also know that humility attracts the Holy Spirit. That's one reason why the Blessed Virgin is so completely united to the Holy Spirit. She's the most humble creature. So let us strive for the same humility. In coming to understand our inability to save ourselves, we recognize that God alone is able to save us. We are incapable of saving ourselves. Hence, we should rely on ourselves less and rely on God alone. So poverty of spirit is principally humility and confidence. This is the foundation of the spiritual life. Now Christ is the perfect revelation of divinity and humanity. The master is the model of all the virtues. To understand true humility, let us meditate on the humility of Christ. If the God-man humbled himself unto death on the cross, how much do we, who are made of nothing, need to humble ourselves? Let us consult Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 to 9. Quote, Have this mind among yourselves, which was in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him, and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father." St. Gregory of Nyssa in All the Beatitudes writes, quote, What greater poverty is there for God than the form of a servant? What is more than for the King of creation to share in our poor nature? The ruler of rules, the Lord of lords, puts on voluntarily the garb of servitude. The judge of all becomes a subject of governors. The Lord of creation dwells in a cave. He who holds the universe in his hands finds no place in the inn, but is cast aside into the manger of a rational beast. End quote. From SeekingVirtueAndWisdom.com St. John Chrysostom in Against Marcionists and Manichaean says, quote, Now observe, he commanded men to be lowly-minded and meek, and he taught this by his words. But see how he also teaches it by his deeds. For having said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek, he shows how these virtues ought to be practiced. How then did he teach them? He took a towel and girded himself and washed the disciples' feet. What can match this lowliness of mind? For he teaches this virtue no longer by his words only, but also by his deeds. Quote, if the Lord humbled himself so greatly, how much more do we poor sinners, who were made out of nothing, need to humble ourselves? You might now wonder how do we cultivate humility? Let's go to the saints and spiritual masters, the many faces of Christ, that further elaborate on the master's teaching. In a vision, Christ said to St. Catherine of Siena, quote, Do you know, daughter, who you are and who I am? If you know these two things, you have beatitude in your grasp. You are she who is not, and I am he who is. End quote. These are the two poles of the spiritual life, self-knowledge and knowledge of God. God is the great I am, whereas we are not. God alone has the plenitude of being. We are created out of nothing and have nothing of ourselves. This sets the stage of our relationship to God. We must focus on self-knowledge. We must come to know our own inability and sinfulness through our many failures. Then we must acknowledge God's goodness and mercy. From this we come to trust in God and foster an attitude of humility and thanksgiving. If we only had self-knowledge, we would err on the side of despair. We can't do it. We have no way of overcoming sin and saving ourselves. And if we only had knowledge of God's goodness and mercy, we would err on the side of presumption. We would think we were already saved and it wouldn't matter if we sinned. St. Catherine of Siena wrote, quote, This is the cell of true self-knowledge, and there you will find knowledge of God's goodness to you. The cell is really two rooms in one, and while you are in the one, you must at the same time be in the other. Otherwise, your soul would end up either in confusion or in presumption. For if you stayed in self-knowledge, spiritual confusion would be the result. And if you stayed only in knowledge of God, you would end up in presumption. So the one has to be seasoned by the other, and the two made to be one. When this is accomplished, you will arrive at perfection. Here's why. From knowledge of yourself, you will gain hatred for your selfish sensuality. And because of that hatred, you will be a judge. You will mount the bench of your conscience and demand an account of yourself, letting no sin pass without doing it justice. From this knowledge issues a spring of humility, which never acts on assumptions, never takes scandal in anything, but bears with joyful patience any injury, any loss of consolation, any suffering from any source whatever. Disgraces appear as a sort of glory, and fierce persecution as refreshment, in all of them it rejoices at seeing itself chastised for the perverse law of selfish sensual will, which is constantly rebelling against God. And it sees itself conform with Christ Jesus crucified, who is the way and teaching of truth. In the knowledge of God, you will discover the fire of divine charity, where you will find your pleasure on the cross with the spotless lamb, searching out God's honor and the salvation of souls in continual and humble prayer. Herein lies all our perfection. There are many other things, 
but this is the principal one. In this we receive so much light that we cannot be wrong in the lesser works that follow. Siloan the Athenite is a saint in the Eastern Orthodox Church, but not the Catholic Church. And one day Christ told him, quote, the proud always suffer from devils, end quote. When asked how to defeat pride, Christ told him, quote, keep thy mind in hell and despair not, end quote. In other words, we are to admit the full magnitude of our wretchedness and miseries, yet acknowledge God's goodness. To keep our mind in hell is to recognize the weight of our sin and to condemn ourselves and to realize what we deserve. But to despair not is to trust in God's mercy. We no longer have confidence in ourselves since we realize we merited hell, but we trust in Christ since he merited us salvation. This is similar to what the Lord Jesus Christ taught St. Catherine of Siena. St. Faustina in Divine Mercy in My Soul, Diary 6, 1711 says, quote, When I was left alone with the Blessed Virgin, she instructed me concerning the interior life. She said, the soul's true greatness is in loving God and in humbling oneself in his presence, completely forgetting oneself and believing oneself to be nothing, because the Lord is great, but he is well pleased only with the humble. He always opposes the proud." End quote. In the book, Rose Among Thorns, we see St. Francis of Sales say, quote, As to humility, this virtue sees to it that we are neither troubled by our imperfections nor in the habit of recalling those of others. For why should we be more perfect than our brothers? Why should we find it strange that others have imperfections, since we ourselves have so many? Humility gives us a soft heart for the perfect and the imperfect, for the former out of reverence, and for the latter out of compassion. Humility makes us accept pains with meekness, knowing that we deserve them, and good things with gratitude, knowing that we do not. Every day we ought to make some act of humility, or speak heartfelt words of humility, words that lower us to the level of the servant, and words that serve others, however modestly, either in our homes or in the world." End quote. Now St. Mother Teresa has a list of practical acts we can perform to cultivate humility. Here's her list. 1. Speak as little as possible about yourself. 2. Keep busy with your own affairs and not those of others. 3. Avoid curiosity. 4. Do not interfere in the affairs of others. 5. Accept small irritations with good humor. 6. Do not dwell on the faults of others. 7. Accept censures even if unmerited. 8. Give in to the will of others. 9. Accept insults and injuries. 10. Accept contempt, being forgotten and disregarded. 11. Be courteous and delicate, even when provoked by someone. 12. Do not seek to be admired and loved. 13. Do not protect yourself behind your own dignity. 14. Give in in discussions, even when you are right. 15. Choose always a more difficult task. Now let us go to the Meditation on Humility from the book Divine Intimacy by Father Gabriel of St. Mary of Magdalene, OCD. Page 315 we hear, quote, Among all the creatures in which we take pleasure and toward which our nature seems to be attracted the most, self undoubtedly holds the first place. There is no one, no matter how limited in talents and good qualities, who does not love his own excellence and who does not try, in one way or another, to make it shine forth to himself and to others. It is for this reason that we often spontaneously exaggerate our own worth, and as a result are demanding and pretentious. This makes us haughty and arrogant, as well as difficult in our relations with others. Humility is the virtue which keeps within just limits the love of one's own excellence, whereas self-esteem often induces us to make ourselves too evident or to occupy a place which is higher than our due. Humility keeps us in our own place. Humility is truth. It tends to establish in truth both our intellect by making us know ourselves as we really are and our life by inclining us to take, in relation to God and to men, our proper place and no other. Humility makes us realize that, in the sight of God, we are only his little creature, entirely dependent upon him for our existence and for all our works. Having received life from God, we cannot subsist even one moment independently of him. He who gave us existence by his creative action maintains life in us by his conserving action. In addition, we cannot perform the slightest act without God's cooperation, in the same way that a machine, even a perfect one, cannot make any motion until it's started by the one who made it. It is very true that, unlike the machine, our acts are neither mechanical nor compulsory, but are conscious and free. Yet we cannot move even a finger without the concurrence of the divine artist. It follows then that everything we possess in the order of being, qualities, gifts, capacities, and everything we have accomplished in the order of action, is not ours, but all in one way or another are gifts of God. All our acts performed with God's help. Quote, what hast thou that thou hast not received? And if thou hast received it, why dost thou glory? as if thou hast not received it." End quote. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. In the supernatural order, where everything depends on grace, the words of Jesus, quote, without me you could do nothing, and John 15, 5, are more strictly verified. Although in baptism, sanctifying grace raised us to the supernatural order, and the infused virtues made us capable of producing supernatural acts, still St. Paul says, quote, no man can save the Lord Jesus but by the Holy Ghost. End quote. In order to perform even the tiniest supernatural act, we need God's help. We need actual grace which prevents us by its inspirations and accompanies us, 
in the act until it's accomplished. The great theologian who has profoundly studied Catholic doctrine has this absolute need of actual grace in order to put into practice the most insignificant point of Catholic doctrine or to produce a single act of the love of God as is a peasant who knows nothing beyond his catechism. Even a saint, one who has received so many favors and divine lights and has attained to heroic virtue, cannot perform the smallest virtuous act without the help of actual grace. How total then must be our dependence upon God. We are very far from the truth if, trusting in our own knowledge or long practice in the spiritual life, we believe that our lights or our virtues are sufficient to make us act like good Christians. No, St. Paul warns us our sufficiency is from God. Without God we cannot think or speak or desire any good. Quote, for it is God who worketh in you both to will and to accomplish according to his good will." End quote. Philippians 2.13 Now before moving on to the next beatitude, it's worth noting that a secondary aspect of poverty of spirit is attachment from created good. St. Francis of Sales in Introduction to the Devout Life, Part 3, Chapter 14 says the following, quote, He is poor in spirit, whose heart is not filled with the love of riches. And this, my child, is what your heart should be, open only to heaven, impenetrable to riches and earthly treasures. If you have them, Keep your heart from attaching itself to them. Let it maintain a higher level, and amidst riches be as though you had none, superior to them. Do not let the mind, which is the likeness of God, cleave to mere earthly goods. Let it always be raised above them, not sunk in them." End quote. Now the second and third Beatitudes are as follows. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The two Beatitudes of mourning and meekness remove obstacles in our spiritual life. They are purifying whereas the following Beatitudes are positive. Mourning purifies or puts order in our concupiscible passion. The concupiscible passions are love and hatred, desire and aversion, joy or delight, and sorrow or grief or pain. Meekness purifies our irascible passions, or the passions that overcome difficulties. Now concerning the second Beatitude, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. The promise is to those who mourn, the reward is to be comforted. This seems quite contradictory to human nature. How are those who mourn blessed? Well, let's first understand what mourning is. There are three types of mourning. The first type of mourning is the mourning of repentance. This is sorrow of contrition, detestation of our sins, and a firm resolution to stop sinning. We must hate and regret our sin, for this is what crucified our Lord, who so greatly loves us. St. Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9-10 to 10 says, quote, As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting, for you felt a godly grief, so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation and brings no regret, but worldly grief produces death." End quote. So here we see that the mourning for our sins leads to repentance, which leads to eternal life, the beatific vision. So those who mourn for their sins will be comforted by the promise of heaven. Concerning the second beatitude, St. Chromatius in Tractate of Matthew says, quote, Rather he is speaking of those blessed persons who do not cease to mourn over the iniquity of the world or the offenses of sinners with a pious, duty-bound sentiment. To those who mourn righteously, therefore, they will receive, and not undeservedly, consolation of eternal rejoicing promised by the Lord." End quote. From this morning of our sins, we are moved toward reparation. We see Blessed Columba Marmion in Christ the Life of the Soul, page 199, say, quote, By his acts of penance, he unites himself to God in his hatred of sin and to his justice that demands the expiation of it. The soul then sees sin by faith through the eyes of God. I have sinned, it says. I have committed an act of which I cannot measure all the malice. But that is so terrible, and so much violates God's rights his justice, his holiness, and love, that only the death of the man-God could expiate it. Then move with sorrow, the soul says to God, O oh my God, I detest my sin. I long to avenge thy rights by penance. I would rather die than offend thee again. That is the spirit of penance that urges and inclines the soul to make acts of expiation." End quote. Connected with the mourning of repentance is a need to make reparation or amends for our sins. We are moved to carry out good works and penitential acts to compensate for the evil we committed against God. This leads us to the second type of mourning. The second type of mourning is the mourning of attachment. In the spiritual life, we must attach from clinging to agreeable things and detach from fleeing from disagreeable things. The Lord Jesus in Matthew 16, 24 says, quote, Whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. End quote. As followers of Christ, we are commanded to deny ourselves. Denying ourselves can take many forms, but ultimately it's detachment from things we like, and taking up our cross is enduring things we dislike. But why must we practice detachment? Answer that question, let us consult Divine Intimacy, page 236, which says, quote, If the heart is occupied with inordinate attachments of self or creatures, it is clear that it cannot love God with all its strength, which is divided between God and self, between God and creatures. The precept of charity proposed to all Christians requires a radical renunciation of every attachment which is not conformable to the will of God, 
or which is not consistent with the love of God. Total detachment is a logical result of Jesus' commandment and the indispensable means of perfectly fulfilling it. This is why St. John of the Cross insists that if the soul wishes to possess God, it must strip itself of all that is not God. That is why it must give up every satisfaction or attachment which does not lead to God. This is the meaning of his statements. In order to enjoy everything, that is to enjoy God who is everything, do not seek to enjoy anything. Do not seek any inordinate pleasure. In order to possess everything, do not desire to possess anything. When you stop at anything, you do not reach the all. From Ascent of Mount Carmel, Book 1, Chapter 13, 11-12. When the soul, through some disordered attachment, stops at any creature, it interrupts its progress toward God. The nothingness of the creature prevents it from reaching the all of God. End quote. Let's look at common examples of attachments. Maybe we're attached to good food, the internet, warm showers. Maybe we're attached to fleeing from necessary conflict. Maybe we're attached to being perceived as smart. Part of the spiritual life is to do things we don't like, but we know we should do it. And there's a mourning involved with that. It's painful. But we are promised to be comforted. We are comforted by the promise of beatitude. We are comforted by the Holy Spirit. We are comforted by our own spiritual progress. Let us make these small sacrifices so that we could love God more. St. Augustine in On the Sermon on the Mount, Book 1, Chapter 2 says, quote, Mourning is sorrow arising from the loss of things held dear. But those who are converted to God lose those things which they are accustomed to embrace as dear in this world. For they do not rejoice in those things in which they formerly rejoiced. And until the love of eternal things be in them, they are wounded by some measure of grief. Therefore they will be comforted by the Holy Spirit, who on this account chiefly is called the paraclete, i.e. the comforter, in order that while losing the temporal joy, they may enjoy to the full that which is eternal. End quote. A special type of mourning of detachment is the mourning of the councils. The councils of perfection are poverty, chastity, and obedience. These councils all give up on things that are really good. Owning property, getting married and having children, Getting to make our own good choices are all good things. But we are advised to give them up to make a complete holocaust to God. The less creatures occupy our hearts, the more room there is to love God. The counsels of perfection allow us to have an undivided love of God. There is real mourning in the counsels though. It's painful to give up on legitimate goods, which are so natural. However, we have the promise that we will be comforted. In fact, Mark chapter 10 verses 29 to 30 states, quote, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the age to come eternal life, end quote. Now great ways to practice the second beatitude are fasting, vigils, and silence. These are time tested and approved by all the saints, although you should do this with supervision of a spiritual director. Now the third type of mourning is the mourning of special afflictions. We have special afflictions like the death of a loved one or bodily injuries. There's real mourning in these afflictions. We must remember that God is always doing something really good amidst the pain and confusion. Romans 8.28 says, quote, We know that in everything, God works for good with those who love him, who are called according to his purpose. End quote. He knows what measures of comfort, blessings, and trials to give us, and he finally tuned it all for us to aid our salvation. We need to return to the first beatitude. Have confidence in God during the affliction. That's the only way to overcome our trials. One special affliction we Christians nowadays have is a communal mourning of the disintegration of Christendom. We have a special grief since we have a memory of what Christendom once was, and now it's gone, and secular hedonism and materialism has corrupted society at large. It's a difficult time for us Christians living in the world, and it can be very disheartening seeing the way society is going. But we must remember, God is working something really good in it, though. Romans chapter 5 verse 20 says, Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. When we are mourning, meditate on the Lord's agony in the garden. The Lord Jesus Christ mourned for all people at all times. He did penance for all of them. We are drawn into his mourning and share in his afflictions. We are not alone amidst our mourning. Also meditate on the crucifixion. Christ mourned while bearing on all the sins of the world. None of our sufferings will even compare to a drop of what our Lord willingly bore to save our souls. Let us remember this amidst our mourning and learn to unite our sufferings to his for the redemption of poor sinners. When we undergo mourning, we are comforted by the Holy Spirit who aids us in our spiritual growth. Sometimes we have sensible consolations, other times our comfort comes from the promises of eternal life and future rewards. Nevertheless, we still mourn, as purification from sins is painful, but it ultimately allows us to be closer united to God, our true joy. Therefore, we can always remember the promise of being comforted by God from the morning. We just have to be patient. Now, let us consult Divine Intimacy, page 929, and cover a meditation on hope during suffering. Quote, The more we hope in God and the beatific possession of Him, which awaits us in eternal life, so much the more we are disposed, not only to renounce the happiness and satisfaction which creatures can offer us, but also to embrace all the sacrifices necessary to reach eternal life. Many sacrifices are necessary because we cannot go to God except by following the path traced by the Son of God to lead us to Him, the way of the cross. But even though it suffers, the soul who lives by hope can repeat the words of St. Paul, We faint not, for that which is at present momentary and light of our tribulation 
worketh for us above measure exceedingly an eternal weight of glory. The gift of knowledge helps us judge our present sorrows as light when compared with eternal beatitude, in view of which it incites us to bless them, even should they cost us our blood. This is why the apostle rejoiced and glorified in his tribulations, and St. Francis of Assisi saying, The joys I hope for are so great that all pain is dear to me. Quote. The third beatitude is, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. The promise is to the meek, and the reward is that they shall inherit the earth. This beatitude deals with the irascible passions, or our fighting passions. It sets order in them so that they do not dominate us. Rather, they are subject to reason. St. Gregory of Nyssa in The Beatitudes says, quote, Blessed are those who are not easily turned towards the passionate movements of the soul, but who are steadied by reason. End quote. Meekness helps governs the irascible passions in our souls, so we can renew the image of God. Now what is meekness? The essence of meekness is to return a blessing for evil. We do not return evil for evil. From The Father's House Discovering Our Home in the Trinity, page 87, we see 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 9 says, Do not return evil for evil, or reveling for reveling, but on the contrary bless. For to this you have been called, that you may obtain a blessing. St. Augustine in On the Sermon on the Mount, book 1, chapter 2 says, quote, Then the meek are those who yield to acts of wickedness, and do not resist evil, but overcome evil with good. End quote. Meekness is not an incapacity to oppose evil. Rather, it's a well-moderated opposition to evil. Let's turn to the Lord, who is the model of meekness. In John chapter 18, verses 19 to 23, we see, quote, The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temples, where all Jews come together. I have said nothing secretly. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? End quote. The Lord Jesus opposed the injury in a well-moderated way. His words were very well chosen. He says, If I have spoken wrongly, bear witness to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Imagine the level of control he has over his irascible passions to say that during a moment of intense pain. Most of us would probably scream or cry and break down in rage or sorrow. Christ had a great interior calm to say that. He has such self-possession and was full of equilibrium and poise. It was a gentle but firm opposition to evil inflicted upon him. Christ as God had the ability to instantly strike down that officer and send him to hell. Yet Christ chose to be gentle and to move him towards repentance and salvation. That is what meekness does. It returns a blessing for a curse. St. Francis of Sales, in Introduction to the Devout Life, Part 3, Chapter 8 says, quote, Of course it is the duty to resist evil and to repress the faults of those for whom we are responsible, steadily and firmly, but gently and quietly. Nothing so stills the elephant when enraged as the sight of a lamb, nor does anything break the force of a cannonball, so well as wool. Correction given in anger, however tempered by reason, never has so much effect as that which is given altogether without anger. For the reasonable soul being naturally subject to reason, it is a mere tyranny which subjects it to passion, and wherein soever reason is led by passion it becomes odious." End quote. Here we see the wisdom of St. Francis of Sales. He goes to show that meekness makes people more receptive to correction as well. Going back to our model of meekness, we hear in the Bible that Jesus set his face like flint toward Jerusalem. This shows that firmness is an essential part of meekness. Meekness is not denying the evil that occurs. It's not sweeping it under the rug. We must acknowledge the evil or injury, but we ought to respond full of gentleness. Another benefit of meekness is its effect on prayer. Active irascibility is incompatible with deep prayer. Resentment and malice prevents tranquility, which is needed for deep prayer. To abide in the presence of God, we must be free from active irascibility. Meekness allows us to enter into deeper prayer. Have you ever tried to pray while you felt resentment or anger? Anyone who has knows you can't pray well. The Holy Spirit needs a tranquil heart that will listen to his subtle movements to enter deep into the inner sanctuary. Now from St. Paul, we know that righteous anger is real. The precept says we are to avoid unrighteous anger, meaning there is such thing as justified anger. But the counsel given by the fathers and the saints is that it's better off without any anger, even if it's permissible. Just let it go. Everyone thinks their anger is righteous, but not everyone's anger is righteous. It's better to just forgive. St. Francis de Sales in Introduction to the Devout Life, Part 3, Chapter 8 says, quote, The same St. Augustine, writing to Profiturus, says that it's better to refuse entrance to any even the least semblance of anger, however just, that because once entered in, it is hard to be got rid of, and what was but a little moat soon waxes into a great beam. For if anger tarries till night, and the sun goes down upon our wrath, a thing expressly forbidden by the apostle, there is no longer any way of getting rid of it. It feeds upon endless false fancies, for no angry man ever yet but thought his anger just." Alright, but how do we acquire meekness if we are so accustomed to becoming angry, 
especially at specific people we find disagreeable. To arrive at meekness and to be free from anger, we must acknowledge that there is the person, then there's the experience of the person, which is finite and limited, then there's our interpretation of the experience of the person. We form judgments of the person based on these interpretations. We get into patterns of passionate reactions of interpretations of experiences of others. Let's say you're angry with your dad. To get free from anger at your dad, you must change your interpretation of your experiences of your dad, and this will lead to a change in your physiological reactions to experience of the person. We must look at people under a different lens. We must bring our experience and our memories of other people into a higher light. Ask the question, what's the whole truth about person so-and-so? We have no idea of what is in others' hearts. Everyone's a mystery. Here are some considerations to make. Every person is a mystery. Every person is made in the image of God. Every human being has a specially created soul. Every human person is dearly beloved by God. Jesus Christ died for them. Think about this concretely with actual people and your experience with them. Do you see them in light of the fact that Jesus Christ went out of his way to be crucified for their salvation? Do you so desire their salvation as much as Jesus does? Every person needs compassion. Do you want to others as you want done unto you? To learn to look at others in a new light, beg God to see others differently. Dedicate holy hours to see people differently. Do this with your friends, your enemies, your family, even with bishops and popes. If you were to watch the news or even look at how Catholics spoke about Joe Biden, would you remember that he has an immortal soul that was specially created by God and that Jesus Christ died for him to have the chance to be united with him forever? We must learn to see others in a higher light. This is especially necessary for interactions online, especially on Twitter. It's very easy to simply view the other person you're arguing with as a threat that must be eradicated. Rather than calling them an idiot and ratioing them, do we remember that this person has an immortal soul and that Christ went out of his way to die for their sins? When we are angry online, let us tame our tongue, for it's better to say less than regret what is being said. For once something is said, one can't take it back. For the people you resent or the people who have harmed you in any way, go before the Blessed Sacrament and pray for the person for 21 consecutive days. Pray that God blesses that person in all the ways you want yourself to be blessed. After doing this for 21 days, you will have the habit of loving the person and returning a blessing for a curse. Now this beatitude rewards us with the ability to inherit the earth. Inheriting the earth means to possess the new heaven, the new earth, in the land of the living. This promise is a great incentive for us to return blessings for the evils incurred upon us. Additionally, St. Francis of Sales says, meekness makes us acceptable to men, and this could be another interpretation of inheriting the earth. You must beg for meekness. Ask to share the sentiments in the heart of Christ. Properly ordered passions allows for divine agape. Let us consult divine intimacy, page 913, which says, quote, Blessed are the meek, for they shall possess the land. What land? First of all, that of their own heart, since St. Thomas says, Meekness makes a man master of himself. Without this interior control of our impulses, feelings of animosity, of antipathy, indignation, anger, we might be able to present an appearance of meekness as worldlings do when it's opportune, but we will never have the profound meekness which calmly faces all the trials of daily living. Furthermore, this complete self-control is what Jesus said would enable us to possess the land of a broader, more beautiful sense, that is, to possess the hearts of others. If we wish to be of service to our brethren, winning their hearts and orienting them to goodness and truth, that is to God, we must not use force or any authority which exasperates others and arouses opposition, but rather meekness, patience, and forbearance. This is a method used by Jesus, who himself announced his mission as one of meekness. The fourth beatitude is, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. The promise is to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. The reward is to be satisfied. Now there are three senses of the term righteousness. The first meaning of righteousness refers to the divine attribute of righteousness. In other words, the justice of God. God is just since he sets things right. When we hunger for the divine attribute of righteousness, we hunger for God himself due to divine simplicity. Psalm 42 verse 2 says, My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and behold the face of God? Righteousness can also be thought of as Jesus. We thirst for Jesus that he may intoxicate us with his love. Righteousness can also refer to the heavenly doctrine and teachings from above. We yearn to hear the word of God. Righteousness can also refer to the will of God, submission of our human will to God's will. Not my will, but thy will be done. According to Father James Brent in The Father's House Discovering Our Home in the Trinity, page 89, we see Christ hungering and thirsting for the will of the Father to be done. John chapter 8 verse 34 we hear, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of the one who sent me, and to finish his work. So Christ here is hungering to do the will of the Father. Matthew chapter 26 verse 39 says, And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, My Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And Christ here is thirsting to do the will of the Father. So we ought to hunger and thirst to do God's will. St. Leo the Great in Sermon 95, 6 says, Quote, it is nothing bodily, nothing earthly, that this hunger, this thirst seeks for, 
but it desires to be satiated with the good food of righteousness and wants to be admitted to all the deepest mysteries and be filled with the Lord himself, end quote. Righteousness can also refer to our own holiness and sanctification, to become another Christ, to be a saint. 2 Corinthians 5, 20-21 says the following, quote, We beseech you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God, end quote. All men are called to be saints. Vatican II clearly teaches the universal call to holiness. The guide to sainthood is shown by the life of Jesus Christ and his many faces, which are the saints. Now, the story of saints can be a setup for disappointment. They can show us our own lukewarmness, mediocrity, and indifference. To remedy our defects, we must 1. Acknowledge the truth of it. 2. Pray for the grace of a fresh zeal and to pray that other lukewarm souls will have a fresh zeal for the Lord. And 3. Meditate on the love of Christ for us. The third meaning of righteousness is justice in the world justice between human beings and each other, and justice between God and man. This means you want the world to be a better place. You want to establish order between men, such that men respect each other's rights and love each other. You desire men's relationship with God to be set right. You desire an end to sin, and the conversion of sinners to Jesus Christ. True justice won't happen until the second coming, when Christ comes to judge the nations and separate the sheep from the goats. But we can work to bring the gospel truth to the world, making it a more just place. Remember that the cross is the beginning of the end of the world. Christ conquered the world at the cross. The blood of Jesus must be applied to every nation, establishing justice. Ancient Christians would recite, Let grace come and let this world pass away, as seen in the Didache. We must seek the justice that is to come and think eschatologically. Those who pursue righteousness and justice will be satisfied in heaven, where there is perfect order and justice. Let us follow the meditation from Divine Intimacy, pages 907 to 908. Quote, Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after justice, for they shall have their fill. The word justice must be taken in the very broad sense, signifying perfection, sanctity, and a total gift of self to God and to souls. It is in this sense that the Holy Spirit impels a soul, revealing to it ever wider horizons, calling it to ever more perfect works and to an increasing generous and complete gift of self. Such a soul can no longer reserve anything for itself. The Holy Spirit will not permit it. It must give itself wholly. The charity of Christ precedeth, the soul repeats with St. Paul. It is consumed by a burning thirst for God's will which it seeks even as the miser searches for gold. It is an ardent thirst for sanctity, which will not tolerate the slightest infidelity to grace. The soul always thinks itself to be doing too little for God, and if it were lawful for it to be destroyed a thousand times for him, it would be comforted. John of the Cross, Dark Night of the Soul, Book 1, Chapter 19.3 It has a burning thirst for souls, and continually spends itself for them, without ever sparing itself. It thirsts for God's glory, and has no thought of rest but is always ready for new sacrifices and labors. Whence comes our courage and zeal, not from its own strength and energy, as it well knows, but it springs from the power of the Holy Spirit, from trust in Him and docility to His inspirations. The fifth beatitude is, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The promise is to the merciful, and the reward is that they shall obtain mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is love healing people's afflictions. We must develop compassion of the heart. We want to apply healing balm to those in need. St. Gregory of Nyssa in the Beatitudes says, quote, Mercy is a loving disposition towards those who suffer distress. For as unkindness and cruelty have their origin in hate, so mercy springs from love, without which it could not exist. Christ is the perfect model for mercy, both in his public ministry and during the crucifixion. In Mark chapter 8, verse 2, we see, I have compassion on the crowd. In Acts 10, verse 38, we see, God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power how he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. At the crucifixion, Christ was bearing the sins of the entire world and undergoing the most brutal pain in his body and soul. While he was so unjustly punished, he underwent such extreme suffering for those who were crucifying him. He was dying for all mankind to have a chance at redemption, to be reconciled to God. This is the greatest mercy known to man. St. Faustina in her diary, Notebook 1, 367, quotes the Lord Jesus saying, my heart overflows with great mercy for souls, and especially for poor sinners. If only they could understand that I am the best of fathers to them, and that it is for them that the blood and water flowed from my heart as from a fount overflowing with mercy. For them I dwell in the tabernacle as king of mercy. Why should we be merciful to others? We need mercy from God, and how can we expect it if we're not merciful to our neighbor? In the Lord's Prayer we say, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And James 2.13 says, for judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. So a motive for being merciful is because we need mercy to avoid hell. That's a pretty good motive. Furthermore, the more merciful we become, the more we resemble our Heavenly Father who forgives our trespasses. St. Leo the Great in Sermon 95.7 says, quote, Mercy wishes you to be merciful, 
righteousness to be righteous, that the Creator may be seen in His creature, and the image of God may be reflected in the mirror of the human heart, expressed by the lines of imitation." End quote. Now how do we be merciful and compassionate? The compassionate carry out the corporal and spiritual works of mercy. The corporal works of mercy are the works of mercy that help the material and physical needs of others. They come from Matthew chapter 25, the books of Isaiah and Tobit. The corporal works of mercy are as follows. To feed the hungry, to give drink to the thirsty, to shelter the homeless, to visit the sick, to visit the prisoners, to bury the dead, to give alms to the poor. When was the last time you've carried out these corporal works of mercy? Do you fall for the trap where you spend too much time exercising your intellect and learning the faith, but don't exercise your will in carrying out the good works that God expects of us? Christ says those who do not carry out these works are damned. Do you want to be damned? Reading theology is good, but if all you do is read theology and argue in discord, you're not living the full Christian life. The demons know more theology than you, but they are damned. Go out and find those who are in need. Get involved with your parish's ministries. It's time to carry out the works of mercy. A good way to start is to spend a little money making care packages for the homeless, supplying them with food, water, clothing, toiletries, and sacramentals, and handing them out and telling those in need how you're doing this in the name of Jesus Christ. There are also many little ways to carry out works of mercy. To fill your brother's glass at meals is a work of mercy. Helping each other's lives be more convenient can be merciful. One can follow St. Therese of Lisieux's little way and carry out little corporal works of mercy all throughout the day. The spiritual works of mercy are works that help the spiritual needs of others, and these are superior to the corporal works of mercy. The spiritual works of mercy are as follows. Counseling the doubtful, instructing the ignorant, admonishing the sinner, comforting the sorrowful, forgiving injuries, bearing wrongs patiently, praying for the living and the dead. A good interior mortification is accepting all afflictions that come your way, whether just or unjust, and offering it up for the conversion of poor sinners and the holy souls in purgatory. This is good spiritual work of mercy. We can have mercy on poor sinners by offering up our lives, sorrows, and daily grind for special graces to wake up dead consciences. There are so many people living lives of habitual mortal sin who have lost the sense of sin. They will surely be damned unless we intercede and offer prayers and sacrifices for them to lead to their repentance. Remember, we shall receive mercy according to the measure that we are merciful. This is a great incentive for us to be merciful, just like the Heavenly Father is. If we do not forgive others, God will not forgive us. This is a scary thought. And so if we want to receive the infinite mercy of God, we must forgive all of our enemies. Here's one concrete way to practice forgiveness. For those who you're angry with, hold grudges, and have not forgiven, go before the Blessed Sacrament and say, quote, In the name of Jesus Christ, I forgive blank for doing blank, end quote. Then pray for that person that they may receive all the blessings you desire. If we show human mercy, we open ourselves up to divine mercy. Let's read a meditation from Divine Intimacy, page 920. God is infinitely merciful because he knows the depth of our misery. We are far from being merciful because we know too little about it. By the gift of counsel, the Holy Spirit enlightens us on this point, particularly in regard to our own personal wretchedness. In our failures and in our falls, he repeats in the depths of our hearts the warnings of Jesus. Without me, you could do nothing. You are unprofitable servants. This lesson gradually becomes more and more vivid and effective through experience, and it penetrates our souls more deeply. We do not need long reasonings to persuade us of our insufficiency, our nothingness. We see it and touch it. The gift of counsel has opened our eyes to it. The comprehension of our own personal misery makes us equally understanding of the misery of others. How can one who is really convinced of his own frailty, weakness, and inconstancy dare to condemn others? He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone. The Holy Spirit whispers to us interiorly, when annoyed by the faults of others, we may perhaps be tempted to imitate the cruel conduct of the Pharisees toward the woman taken in adultery. The Holy Spirit wishes to chisel the feature of Jesus in us, transforming us into living images of the Savior. Therefore, he gently and unceasingly urges us to be merciful. He puts into our hearts a love for the miserable, for those who are wretched both in the material and in the moral sense, so that like Jesus, we may go in search of them, ready to sacrifice ourselves for the salvation of their souls. Above all, he spurs us on to seek those who, because they have made us suffer, have a special claim to our mercy. We can no longer be satisfied with forgiving them and treating them with kindness, but we must experience the need of doing good to them if we are to fully carry out the teaching of Jesus. Do good to them that hate you. The sixth beatitude is, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. The promise is to the pure of heart, the reward is to see God. St. Francis de Sales, in Introduction to the Devout Life, Part 3, Chapter 12 says, quote, Of a truth, my daughter, Without purity, no one could ever see God, nor can any hope to dwell in his tabernacle, except he lead an uncorrupt life. And our blessed Lord himself has promised a special blessing of beholding him to those that are pure in heart. End quote. The reward to see God can refer to the beatific vision, which is our eternal destiny, or to the grace of contemplation, where we see God in a gaze of love in this life. So let's examine what purity of heart is, since the reward is so great. There are four sides to purity of heart. One. 
purity of heart can refer to freedom from sinful intentions and consent to sin. Our inner being must make a resolution to never offend God and to turn away from sin. 2. Purity of heart can also refer to charity. 1 Corinthians 13, 4-8 says, Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. 3. Purity of heart could also refer to seeking God above all things. Psalm 68.32 says, You who seek God, let your hearts revive. Matthew 6.22 says, If your eye is sound, your whole body will be full of light. Meaning, if you seek God first, you will be filled with the light of grace. And 4. Some saints also say that purity of heart refers to chastity. This beatitude is also known as the monastic beatitude. The monk is advised to keep this beatitude before him at all times. St. John Cassian, in the Conferences, Conference 1, Chapter 4, quotes Abba Moses who says, quote, The end of our profession indeed, as I said, is the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven. But the immediate aim or goal is purity of heart, without which no one can gain that end. Fixing our gaze and steadily on this goal, as if on a definite mark, let us direct our course as straight towards it as possible. And if our thoughts wander somewhat from this, let us revert to our gaze upon it and check them accurately as by a sure standard, which will always bring back all our efforts to this one mark and will show at once if our mind has wandered ever so little from the direction marked out for it. Now, how does one obtain purity of heart? We have active purification and passive purification. Active purification is where our own efforts, supported by grace, mortify our passions. Passive purification is God's work of purification for us. It's the spiritual and material trials He puts us through to purify us. Through purification, we turn away from sin. We get attached to creatures, we grow in charity, and we more firmly unite ourselves to God's will. We will then arrive at purity of heart. The Holy Spirit purifies our intellect. He reproduces the kenosis or self-emptying of Christ in our hearts. We can speak of three emptings of the Holy Spirit. 1. He empties our hearts of the seven deadly sins. 2. He empties our hearts for disordered desires for legitimate goods. We subdue natural desires for natural goods to stop them from anchoring us down to the flesh. This could be achieved with fasting, silence, and vigils. And this allows us to detach from all created goods. The more room creatures have in our hearts, the less room we have for God. And number 3. We could empty the heart of all self-will. If we have purity of heart, we will see God in this world and the next which means we will receive the grace of contemplation here and the beatific vision in eternity. Now, what is contemplation? Catechism of the Catholic Church, paragraph 2715 says, Contemplation is a gaze of faith fixed on Jesus. I look at him and he looks at me. It is to behold God. A natural analogy of contemplation is like a person watching a sunset without figuring out how it all works. They are captivated by the beauty of the big picture. Contemplation is a sigh of affection between lovers, between us and God. It's beholding God in a gaze of love. Contemplation is a pure gift from God. He gives it to us, but our actions can dispose us to this gift. The key way to dispose us to contemplation is to meditate on Christ crucified. St. Catherine of Siena said, We must have a memory of the blood of Christ. The blood of Christ reveals to us the cost of sin and the magnitude of divine love. Now, how do we prepare ourselves for contemplation? St. Padre Pio says, quote, We prepare our hearts when we set ourselves aside to meditate and dispose ourselves for the service we owe to God of loving Him, loving our neighbor, mortifying our external and internal senses, and practicing other good spiritual exercises. End quote. From Padre Pio's Spiritual Direction for Every Day, page 30. The spiritual masters tell us to arrive at contemplation. We must strive to do God's will, practice the virtues, mortifications, and be recollected with the presence of God through ejaculatory prayers. What does mortification, recollection, and ejaculatory prayers mean? I'm glad you asked. Mortifications are voluntary actions by which we gradually put to death all of our vices, sinful habits, and the self-centered tendencies that lurk beneath them. From Catholic Exchange. What is recollection, you might ask? Well, let us consult Divine Intimacy, pages 455 to 457. Saint Teresa of Jesus warmly recommends to interior souls another kind of prayer, much simpler and more profitable, the prayer of recollection. The foundation of this prayer is the divine presence in our souls. The presence of immensity by which God is in us as creator and preserver in so real and essential a manner that in him we live and move and are, so that if he ceased to be present in us, we would cease to exist. The presence of friendship by which in a soul in the state of grace, God is present as a father, as a friend, and as a sweet guest who invites that soul to dwell with the three divine persons, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is the consoling promise of Jesus to the soul who loves him. If anyone loves me, my Father will love him, and we will come to him and we will make our abode with him. The soul collects together all its faculties and enters within itself to be with God. Our senses, imagination, and intellect tend spontaneously toward exterior things on which they are dispersed. 
Therefore, the soul, by a prolonged resolute act of the will, ought to withdraw them from these exterior things in order to concentrate them on interior things, in this little heaven of the soul where the Blessed Trinity dwells. In this way, we shall be able to concentrate entirely on God present within us, and there at His feet, we'll be able to converse with Him to our heart's delight. It will not be difficult to spend even the whole time of prayer in acts of faith, love, and adoration, admiring and contemplating the great mystery of the indwelling of the Trinity in our poor heart, and offering our humble homage to the three divine persons. But if this is not enough, we can also use other practices. Hidden there within our soul, we can think about the passion and picture of the Son, and offer him to the Father without tiring the mind by going to seek him on Mount Calvary, or in the garden, or at the column. Or else, more simply, we could speak with him as with a father, a brother, a lord, and a spouse, sometimes in one way, sometimes in another. We can tell him our troubles, beg him to put them right, and yet realize we are not worthy to be called his child. And the saint concludes with these words, those who are able to shut themselves up in this way, within this little heaven of the soul, where dwells the maker of heaven and earth, may be sure that they are walking on an excellent road and will come without fail to drink of the water of the fountain. Now, what is ejaculatory prayer? It is a quick prayer that is recited that acts like a dart to God. The desert monks would recite these throughout the day to remain in God's presence. St. Padre Pio says, quote, I urge you to recite ejaculatory prayers from time to time. Those prayers are like arrows that wound God's heart and oblige him. And this word is not at all exaggerated in this case. Oblige him, I tell you, to grant you his graces and his help in everything. End quote. Padre Pio, Spiritual Direction for Everyday, page 9. So if you practice mortification, recollection, and ejaculatory prayer while pursuing God's will, you are predisposing yourself to contemplative prayer. St. Albert the Great, in On Cleaving to God, chapter 5, connects purity of heart with the prayer of recollection and purification of our intellectual faculties by detachment. Quote, For this reason, apply yourself at all times of purity, clarity, and peace of heart above all things, so that, so far as possible, you can keep the doors of your heart resolutely bared to the forms and images of the physical senses and worldly imaginations by shutting off the doors of the physical senses and turning within yourself. After all, purity of heart is recognized as the most important thing among all spiritual practices as its final aim, and the reward for all the labors that a spiritual-minded person and true religious may undertake in this life. For this to come about, you must repeatedly retreat into your heart and remain there, keeping yourself free from everything so far as possible. You must always keep the eye of your mind clear and still. You must guard your understanding from daydreams and thoughts of earthly things. You must completely free the inclination of your will from worldly cares and cling with all your being to the supreme true good with fervent love. You must keep your memory always lifted up and firmly anchored in the same true supreme good and the only uncreated reality. In just this way, your whole mind gathered up with all its powers and faculties in God may become one spirit with him in whom the supreme perfection of life is known to consist. This is the true union of spirit and love by which a man is made compliant to all the impulses of the supreme eternal will so that he becomes by grace what God is by nature. End quote. Moving back to the beatitude regarding purity of heart, we have other saints assert that purity of heart refers to chastity. St. Alphonsus Liguori in the School of Christian Perfection, chapter 6, titled Chastity, says, quote, Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. No one knows the value of chastity better than God himself. Now God says, No price is worthy of a continent soul. All that man prizes and esteems, riches, pleasures, honors, bear no comparison to a continent soul. St. Ephraim calls chastity the life of the spirit. St. Peter Damien styles it the queen of virtues. And St. Cyprian says by means of chastity, we celebrate the most glorious triumphs. He who conquers the vice opposed to the virtue will easily triumph over the rest. End quote. Now you might wonder how to overcome lust and acquire chastity. Thankfully, St. Alphonsus has a guide for us all. St. Alphonsus' method of overcoming lustful temptations. 1. During temptation, humble ourselves before God, distrust ourselves and place confidence in God. 2. Have recourse to God. Call on the holy names of Jesus and Mary during temptation. 3. Go to confession and receive the Eucharist. Reveal your temptations to your confessor. St. Philip Neri said a temptation revealed is a temptation half overcome. 4. Have devotion to Mother of God. She is most pure and will guide you to chastity. 5. Avoid idleness. My confessor personally told me that lust likes to take things for one's own possession. When one is being generous with his time and making a gift to oneself, he is countering that desire for self-possession. Rather than caving inwards, he caves outwards. 6. Have custody of the eyes. Don't gaze at a woman's beauty. St. Augustine says, From the look proceeds the thought, and from the thought the desire. The more you look, the more you'll be tempted, and the more likely you will fall. So now you know how to attain purity of heart, and how to overcome lust as well, which will open you to contemplative prayer. Every Christian is called to contemplative prayer, but few actually experience it due to lack of knowledge and lack of generosity to God. The seventh beatitude is, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Promise is for the peacemakers. The reward is that they shall be called sons of God. All of the preceding beatitudes are the works of peace. Peace is the tranquility of order. According to Father James Brent in his book, The Father's House, page 94, peacemaking is putting things in proper order. 
Poverty of spirit establishes our proper order to God in our self-understanding. The beatitude of mourning puts proper order in our concupiscible passion, and the beatitude of meekness puts proper order in our irascible passions. Hungering and thirsting for righteousness sets proper order in God's justice. Mercy sets proper order with relationship to our neighbor's lives. Purity of heart sets order in our inner selves. So the time we ascend to the seventh beatitude, we have established proper order in ourselves in our relationship with God and neighbor. So we have peace and will radiate this peace and will work to communicate this peace to others as well. St. Augustine on the Sermon on the Mount, Book 1, Chapter 2 says, Quote, now they are peacemakers in themselves who, by bringing in order all the motions of their soul and subjecting them to reason, i.e. to the mind and spirit, and by having their carnal lust thoroughly subdued, become a kingdom of God, in which all things are so arranged, that that which is chief and preeminent in a man rules without resistance over the other elements, which are common to us with the beasts, and that very element which is preeminent in man, i.e. mind and reason, is brought under subjection to something better still, which is the truth itself, the only begotten Son of God. End quote. So according to St. Augustine, our passions are governed by our will, our will is guided by our intellect, and our reason is submitted to Christ who is the truth. So from this we will have proper order in body, soul, and spirit, where all things become subject to Christ. St. Bonaventure teaches that grace will hierarchize the soul such that there is sacred order placed, and the tranquility of the sacred order is the peace of Jesus Christ. Peace, not confusion, comes from God. 1 Corinthians 14.33 says, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. Peace is an imperishable jewel. It's very precious in God's sight. He wants us to have it. 1 Peter 3.11 says, Let him turn away from evil and do right. Let him seek peace and pursue it. In fact, after his resurrection, the Lord Jesus immediately grants the apostles his peace. Peace be with you. John 20.19 This shows just how central peace is. Peace is both a means and an end. You need it to grow in the spiritual life, and you want to acquire more of it. When we have a tranquil mind that is not clouded by the passions, we can clearly discern the will of God and avoid sin. When water is murky, one cannot clearly and distinctly see through it, but when water is tranquil, all becomes transparent. Likewise, when our mind is overcome by the passions, our judgment is clouded. But when we have peace, our judgment is clearer, and we can clearly do what is good and avoid what is evil. Peace is a necessity, not a luxury, for endurance in the spiritual warfare. St. John Chrysostom, in Homily 3 on Colossians, says, So great a good is peace, as that the makers and producers of it are called the sons of God, with reason because the Son of God for this cause came upon the earth, to set at peace the things in the earth and those in the heavens. But if the peacemakers are the sons of God, the makers of disturbance are sons of the devil. St. Francis de Sales has a good insight on why we get anxious. In the book Rose Among Thorns, the saint is quoted saying, quote, Self-love is one of the sources of our anxiety. The others are high regard for ourselves. Why are we troubled to find that we have committed a sin or even an imperfection? Because we thought ourselves to be something good, firm, and solid. And therefore, when we have seen the proof of the contrary and have fallen on our faces in the dirt, we are troubled, offended, and anxious. If we understood ourselves, we'd be astonished that we were ever able to remain standing. This is the other source of our anxiety. We want our consolations, and we are surprised to encounter our own misery, nothingness, and folly. There are three things we must do to be at peace. 1. Have a pure intention to desire the honor and glory of God in all things. 2. Do the little that we can unto that end, following the advice of our spiritual father. 3. And leave all the rest of God's care. End quote. Now that we see the importance of peace, let us pray for the peace of the heavenly Jerusalem to flood our hearts, as well as that of our brothers and even our enemies. The eighth beatitude is, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you, and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so men persecuted the prophets who were before you. The promise is to those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. The reward is the kingdom of heaven. Notice how this beatitude has the same reward as the first, which is receiving the kingdom of heaven. The beatitude cycles back. There's a complete circle. To be persecuted for righteousness' sake is to suffer for the gospel. This beatitude captures the spirituality of martyrdom, which is the ultimate call for Christians. The essence of martyrdom is conformity to Christ crucified. Martyrs want their bodies and souls to be so united to Christ that they become another Christ. This is the final process of conversion to Christ. We now become Christ crucified. To be a Christian is to die for Christ. The next time you receive persecution for standing up for your Christian faith, even if it's something as little as receiving insults for standing up for Christian morality, Remember that you have the promise of the kingdom of heaven. Keep this before your mind and do not be perturbed. Now let's step back and get a bigger picture of the Beatitudes as a whole. 
St. Bernard's teaching in his work on conversion shows that the Beatitudes are the path of conversion for a sinner to become a saint. He first begins with a deep sense of one's own spiritual poverty. He then moves on to a humble admission of one's inability to change and then to a mourning over the soul's stubbornness and petty obstinacy. It manifests in a hungering for righteousness which increases through spiritual and corporal works of mercy and eventually leads to a complete purification of the heart. Among the consummate signs of conversion are a person's increased ability to extend the peace of Christ to others and a willingness to suffer and even die for the faith. From CatholicCulture.org So according to St. Bernard, the Beatitudes captures perfectly the interior process of conversion and adoptive sonship, where we become united to Christ. St. Augustine also shows that the Beatitudes are a ladder of ascent to perfection. St. Augustine on the Sermon on the Mount, Book 1, Chapter 3, says the following, quote, For the Beatitudes begins with humility. Blessed are the poor in spirit, i.e. those not puffed up, or the soul submits itself to divine authority, fearing lest after this life it go away to punishment, although perhaps in this life it might seem to itself to be happy. Then it, the soul, comes to the knowledge of the divine scriptures, where it must show itself meek in its piety, lest it should venture to condemn that which seems absurd to the unlearned, and should itself be rendered unteachable by obstinate disputations. After that, it now begins to know in what entanglements of this world it is held by reason of carnal custom and sins. And so, in this third stage, in which there is knowledge, the loss of the highest good is mourned over, because it sticks fast in what is lowest. Then in the fourth stage there is labor, where vehement exertion is put forth, in order that the mind may wrench itself away from those things in which, by reason of their pestilential sweetness, it is entangled. Here therefore righteousness is hungered and thirsted after, and fortitude is very necessary, because what is retained with delight is not abandoned without pain. Then at the fifth stage, to those persevering in labor, counsel for getting rid of it is given. For unless each one is assisted by a superior, in no way is he fit in his own case to extricate himself from so great entanglements of miseries. But it is a just counsel that he who wishes to be assisted by a stronger should assist himself who is weaker in that in which he himself is stronger. Therefore blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. At the sixth stage there is purity of heart, able from a good conscience of good works to contemplate that highest good, which can be discerned by the pure and tranquil intellect alone. Lastly is the seventh wisdom itself i.e. the contemplation of the truth, tranquilizing the whole man and assuming the likeness of God, which is thus summed up, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And the eighth, as it were, returns to the starting point, because it shows and commends what is complete and perfect. Therefore in the first and in the eighth the kingdom of heaven is named. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. As it is now said, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Seven in number, therefore, are the things which bring perfection. For the eighth brings into light and shows what is perfect, so that starting, as it were, from the beginning again, others who are perfected by means of these stages. End quote. As we have seen, the Beatitudes are a wellspring of spiritual insight and an outline for our process of becoming sons of God. As Christians, we are called to carry out the Beatitudes in our daily life. But how often do we consciously strive for them? I know I fall short. Even while I make this video, I fall short. My challenge for you and for myself is to focus on one specific Beatitude for this whole month. Keep it before your mind and let it be a hermeneutic for your daily life. Even use it as an ejaculatory prayer which you recite throughout the day. Let's see how it goes. After a month, if you remember, be sure to tell me how it changed your life. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you found this video spiritually fruitful. Please like and subscribe and share this video on Discord and Twitter. Also follow at Catholic Duong on Twitter for more content. Here are some links to the images used in this video. <laughs>